Joe here, your reliability man, bridging the gap between reliability best practices and the reality that you live in every day. Bringing to you stories from my times as a plant manager, a department leader, and engineer. Today's topic is a story. I'm gonna tell a reliability story. People love stories. This was one of a handful of them that formed my beliefs on uh, where the opportunities lie in the reliability space. This topic is gonna to be a wrench time example. I'll have some future ones on problem solving, okay? So first of all, hit like and subscribe. Challenge to this group. I'd like to get up to 150 subscribers today uh, with this video. So this was an experience a few years ago when I was the director of reliability and, and maintenance uh, for a corporation globally. Um, so my job was to go to plants uh, and I created this job. So I went to plants and I wanted to facilitate them, uh, their lead team into creating a strategic reliability plan. Not my plan, I wanted them to create a plan. And if you remember from the results pyramid, uh, I wanted to create a new experience for them to change their beliefs, which would change their actions and lead to different results. So an experiential learning process, okay? Uh, so one of the first things I did is I trained some coaches, okay? Uh, I trained about four coaches at this particular plant. I won't say what it, where it was uh, or uh, I just won't do that, okay? Just to protect them a little bit. So I trained coaches uh, on how to facilitate. I also trained the entire lead team. This includes your, your controller, your safety person, HR, Operations leads, maintenance leads, engineering leads. This is a lead team activity. Drained them on to seven forms of waste, rules and use. The last video was on that. And how to observe. That took about a half day. Okay. And the lead team members were paired one-on-one -on -one with me or one of the coaches. I happened to be assigned to the plant manager. You know, uh, so the job that was handpicked for the plant manager and myself to go out and see was processing bath. And I'll talk about that in a second, but processing bath after it was removed from the aluminum smelting pot and was going to be crushed up for reuse. So what is bath? Real quickly here, uh, this is a plan view looking down at a pot. Uh, this pot is a really a metal shell of uh, steel, 30 foot long, 12 foot wide roughly, with a lot of these 2,000 pound aluminum anodes, or 2,000 pound carbon anodes, sorry, carbon anodes inside of there. And what you're doing is you're passing current between this anode and then the cathode shell. So here is a uh, slice of a pot. So the blue is the pot, okay? And then the anodes are shown here in green. Those are large carbon blocks. And then this solid bath material is on top. It's kind of an insulating material hold you know, to make the process a little more efficient. Then you also have molten bath inside around these anodes and it helps the, the electrochemical process make this black line, the molten aluminum. So when you change out these anodes, they need to be changed about every 25 days. You pull them out, you bring out that solid bath and that solid bath is reusable, pretty cool, but you gotta crush it up to be able to use it again. So the plant I was at was fairly new, less than 25 years old. It was well maintained. Uh, things were five best. You know, they have everything set in order, clean. They had a reliability team. They had a lot of planners in their organization, plenty of supervisors. The ratios of planners to supervisors to, uh, to craft employees was actually very good. So this is, is a plant that it actually was set up pretty well. Okay, so the plant manager and I go out to observe the job. You know, the job was to take a rubber skirt off. That had a little metal backing, but it was a skirt on a conveyor that moved that bath material. So the bath material is, in, it's kind of like chunks of concrete, dusty everywhere, chunks falling out everywhere. But there was this skirt that kind of held things in and was part of the, the fume control system, not fume, the dust control system. Uh, that skirt was getting worn and a lot of material getting on the ground, the environment getting dusty periodically. You got to go in and take out this skirt. So that's the job where we're handpicked for the plant manager and the director of reliability to go out and take a look at. The, uh, we arrived at the job. 
Production have locked out the conveyor, but they locked it out fully loaded with material, jammed underneath this skirt, uh, and weren't able to work. So production employees had, you know, who previously locked and tagged this uh, in the uh, in the condition it was in, were in a training session. Had to pull them out of that training session. The production argued with the maintenance personnel uh, on how to do the job, what needed to be locked out, who was supposed to be done, doing what. All in all, but by the time they had it uh, charged back up and then moved all the material out, emptied the belt, relocked it, we lost two hours. Two hours lost. Then a contractor was assigned to come in and vacuum up, clear out the work area, plus the general area. But they were assigned first to clean out the work area so the mechanics could go in there and not have a fall hazard, not trip over some of these blocks of concrete. However, the contractor started in the wrong, wrong location, wrong location. Um, and we waited 90 minutes for them to get to, the lo get to the location and clean it so the mechanics could work. Now, the person that I was observing with, the plant manager, I had to actually hold them back, talk to them about how we're a fly on the war, war on the wall, we're observing reality. They wanted to intervene just because this was just frustrating waste. Creating an experience there, right? Creating an experience. Very frustrating ways for them to see. You know, four mechanics were assigned eight hours to this job. Two groups of two uh, mechanics were, you know, to remove the bolts and then remove the skirting. Uh, took about 45 minutes total to do the work. That's with two groups working. Um, it did take two people to do the job. These were about 10 foot sections, so you needed somebody to kind of hold it while somebody was uh, removing and installing the bolts. The, the crew returned after lunch uh, to remove the tags and turn it back over to production. That's, that's the only work they did. Right, that's not really work, but that's, that's a job that had to be done. It's not really wrench time. Um, but the culture, no, cultural norm at this plant was, hey, if you get your work done, you're done. Okay? So uh, as they were moving, uh, one mechanic was removing their tags and, you know, put, kind of putting things away. You know, I apologized to him on how the job went. And uh, he looked at me confused. Like, uh, I, you know, all jobs go this way. And, and he wasn't being sarcastic about how poorly the job was planned and set up. He was really trying to correct me. It says, this is how work happens. Uh, I think he was a little insulted. I said the job went bad. Um, anyway, um, so, uh, anyway, the calculated wrench time for this job was 9%. You know, recall this was a hand-picked jobs for the plant manager and the director of reliability. Uh, it's a pretty simple, straightforward job. Um, you know, in, uh, the wrench time that was uh, advertised by this plant that they communicated before this event was 42%. So remember, 42% versus 9 So let's talk about some of the waste that we saw in here. Poor coordination between production and, and uh, uh, maintenance, obvious. Poor conduction, poor, poor coordination between contractors and maintenance. Production was pulled out of a training, you know, that that now needs to be rescheduled. Waste the trainer's time. You know, um, overstaffed for the job. Uh, this job could, you know, um, could have been completed in about an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes by just two persons, but they, they chose to put four on the job. So we charged four people eight hours for this job and could have been two people one hour. I mean, gross, grossly overestimated the, the work content and duration. You know, there was no help chain for problem solving. This was all the mechanics and the production operators working through this lock and tag. And, and also through the contractors working in the wrong area. The craftsmen knew that, but there was no help chain process when it got off the, the tracks. The cultural norm was once you get your work done, wink, wink, uh, you don't have to do any more work for the day. That's just part of the process. Where's the improvement cycle? You know, where was the feedback at the end of the day that says, hey, we can do this better or this better or with this different tool, we'll only assign two people to the job. You know, does management act differently when their wrench time is 9% than if it was 42%? Completely different set of uh, decisions you're making because of that. You know, planners made little effort, you know, to uh, uh, attack wrench time, to anticipate wrench time in, uh, issues. So, 
this is not a, a problem with the crafts. This is not that the crafts are lazy. This is not their problem. This is not even a planner problem. This is a lead team problem. They need to know reality and set the expectations and take the actions to you know create a system so that they drive efficiency. This is a lead team problem and they're ignorant to it. Not that they're stupid, they're ignorant to it because they don't get out on the shop floor and do chalk circle type observations, which we just created a whole new experience for that lead team. You know, so this is actually great news. Don't feel down. When this happens at your plant, don't be embarrassed. Don't feel down. This is great news. We got improvement, easy improvement. We, we, you know, we're challenged to be better on Friday than we were on Monday. Here's a golden opportunity to do that. So don't feel bad if this is in your organization. Fear of embarrassment is a major issue in plants. And if you can get over that, you can see waste like this and, and drive improvements and just keep bringing the cash register, helping out the community, helping out your plant. So Joe's challenge for this week, you know, Put some time on your calendar. Go in on your calendar right now and put four hours of standard work every week for the remainder of the year, for the next three months. Put that four hour block, pick a Wednesday afternoon, pick whenever, put that on your calendar to go and see. Go and see a problem that you're having. You know, make it part of your leader standard work. I promise you, you'll make different decisions with chalk circle observation. Hey folks, begin your journey. This stuff isn't that hard. You know, get free pointers from me. Give me some comments on here. Send me an email. Uh, if you want an experience guide, I've been there. I could shave years off your deployment. Thanks.